Uh, You're tonight, in. Tonight, we're going to have kind of a, a two-piece, two, two different subject matters. The first one will be obviously on the subject matter of electronic waste recycling issues and opportunities on it. And the second one, which we'll go right into immediately, will be a product which has been developed by people in another group, some here, but mainly outside another group, to uh, set up an online uh, mobile office for everyone to work with. And there's some big plans, and I can, I'd like to get your feedback on it, and, and, uh, and maybe uh, uh, we can discuss it, you know, we can have some subject matter ideas and some brainstorming, and uh, like some, those are some, some ideas. But uh, get back to this subject. Uh, I have known <laughs> I've known Jeff God, for oh, ten years or so, and I, I how did we ever meet? I kind of figured out was it was you uh, pitched a governmental organization, you know, structure. Uh, uh, yes, I remember. That's right. We're talking about uh, the pharmaceutical industry, the nutraceutical. Uh, the uh, subject matter that we've got now is that over the years, and I, I think you've all seen his background, uh, he's had a lot of experience in different areas, but I always look at him as a creative person, and he has a, a kind of a, a thirst for knowledge, and he's, very, he's a brilliant guy, and he comes up with some great ideas that, with a twist and a different thought, really uh, creates a new image of what business is in. In this particular PC Disciple, he's done marvelous things with it. It started only recently down here in Southern California, and it's really grown to be a major uh, company in the area of electronic waste recycling here in a very short time. Uh, and without uh, any further delay, why don't you uh, tell them what you know and uh, give a little background on yourself, too. Oh, really? Absolutely. <laughs> um, thank you for the invitation. It was very kind to you know, meet fellow entrepreneurs and business leaders, and uh, I please feel that uh, in our discussion tonight that you can interrupt, interrupt me, talk about anything that you feel you're working on or would like to find out how it relates to what we do. Um, I have business ADD. Um, after a few years of developing something and seeing that it's on its feet, I have no interest to make a million dollars and keep going. I really, at the front, and Tom knows this about me, I'd rather take something that's problematic or something that needs to be done, or I see a gap in a, a system and I say, well, let's take it and let's explore it. PC Recycle is exactly that model for me. Um, this is a CEO who came down, had five operations up in Washington State, really got, into, got really started the recycling industry up in Washington, um, came here and said, I'm retired, I'm not going to do anything, but he was just a, a sweet soul, and we talked and I said, California needs to build this and there is nothing uh, in the Tri-County, Santa Barbara, Ventura, North LA County area. This would be a wonderful thing to introduce. And sure enough, we started with uh, in the Gore Hills, uh, with 2,000 square feet, outgrew it in just a few months, uh, developed up to a 20, uh, well, 15,000 square foot facility, outgrew that in a little more than a year. Now we have two facilities running at about 30,000. We're just about to go into a retail operation, and we can keep going, but the, the model works. And the reason why is, it's a growth industry. Um, there is, as, you'll, as we'll go through tonight, you'll see that, you know, when we were growing up, there was one TV for, you know, every so many homes. Um, as it's matured now, it's like 25, you know, cell phones for every home. And if you want, go look in your drawers, see how much you have in your technology. Uh, we were talking just a few minutes ago. I mean, I still have 100 pounds of electronic waste in my garage. So why would I have it? Because I still want to go and, you know, tool around in the garage and pull things out and plug things in and play with them. So all of us, you know, see that this is what where technology is and what we want to use. I'm going to walk you through a little bit about the company, how it's structured. Um, my background was there. I know Tom wants me to go on. Um, I've run for-profit for operations. I've run non-profit operations. Neil, am I lined up okay? I'm not falling out of your border. Very good. So um, I'll just walk you through a little bit about what this company was. Now, this is what PC Recycle was in the beginning. Um, that uh, they, they started as a retail operation. Uh, let me tell you the first client, and you can see how it grew. Uh, there's a little uh, software company that was uh, in Seattle where it began. Uh, it's called Microsoft. 
um, and what he could do is buy out containers. And so he went and he started buying their containers and just opened it up and became like a mini fries up in Washington State. But there was a need for recycling, so he began not only recycling but refurbishing and then this industry grew and grew and he was able to do five or six of these. Did quite well over uh, about a decade. Um, what was very interesting is he got knocked out because a big company came along and said, you don't want to work with PC Recycle, you want to work with us, we're a national company. And we know how to get this right and we'll, we'll take care of you with all the right regulations, with every concern. And what PC Recycle was generating several million dollars for uh, Microsoft at the time, the big company that came in cost them several million, several million dollars. Because what they did is they showed them all the things that they weren't doing right and how they could actually squeeze them. So sometimes, you know, being an entrepreneur and being a small business, you can streamline a lot of these operations. And because this is a growth industry, that's what we learned is stay under the radar, you know, move things out faster. And it, it worked out very well for them. They, they got Microsoft back, by the way, after a few years. Uh, this is Matt. Uh, uh, his background is fascinating. And I would probably spend hours just talking about how this kid uh, escaped from Iran, uh, got into Pakistan uh, because they come from a Baha'i family. Uh, which was persecuted in Iran, they were able to immediately get uh, you know, status here in the United States and were brought over. Um, and he started with nothing. And then little by little he brought his family over uh, so they wouldn't have to undergo, as you read in the newspaper, all the wonderful persecution that goes on in the Middle East. Um, this is the, a little bit of the operation that we have going. And basically what this is is just a straight assembly line to actually take apart television sets. Um, and instead of, you know, you, you'll see in, in more normal businesses that they just lay it out flat and they take off the plastic and they throw it in the box. So well, Farhad or Matt decided, why don't we just drop it? So that way they just keep working and dropping it. So all these things underneath are the drop boxes. So they just keep dropping it in and then the, we don't, don't have any interference. The guys come in with the forklifts or the pallet jacks, pull everything out, stack it up, put it in the containers, and we just keep moving it out. Very simple commodities that we do. Um, there are different standards. Um, Every business has to run by standards. Um, I find it just amazing that this is really almost a, uh, still in the cowboy phase of being developed as an industry. Uh, there's a lot of things that need to be learned. Uh, a lot of fear mongering going on about how dangerous electronic waste is. Um, and that's kind of a, a sad thing, but this is so people can control markets and things. Um, the R2 standard is an EPA standard. R2 stands for uh, Responsible Recycling. Um, then an independent group, a for-profit company, came up with the Eastward Standards and are now trying to push a world standard of what we should do for recycling. The good news is recycling really has come a long way in the last 20 years. It's phenomenal. Um, not that much gets put into, thankfully, uh, into dumps, into landfill sites. A lot of the recyclers are actually taking the time to actually separate them. You've seen all the machinery that large recyclers use. and. So they're able to use magnetic separation, paper, plastics. So this is an important thing. I'm not going to go into the details yet about what this is. But some of the things that, that we have to do in terms of establishing a business, as you would imagine, is we have to have you know, an environmental health and safety a management system. Uh, if you guys know ISO or ISO, ISO uh, 14001 is usually a very strong standard that parallels this. Um, then different strategies that can go through this so that way we have some way of working with other you know, companies, other businesses that go out there. So R2 is a pretty good basic standard. Um, we're governed uh, you know, in, in the state of California by what's called the Department of Toxic Substance Control. And the main concern at this hour, because it becomes you know, catchphrases and bug words, is uh, lead oxide. We're always afraid of lead. So we're afraid that there's lead poisoning. But I have to tell you, all the electronics have such heavy metals that all of it's poisonous. We just haven't begun to discuss what, what are the ramifications of it. So we really do have to go through, you know, in this next decade and decades beyond, uh, what do we mean by how do we protect the environment? And we really are at the beginning of learning, you know, how to do this. Eventually, and the reality is, uh, we'll set up what's called cradle-to-grave systems. So a manufacturer will create something. Uh, we'll have the downlines and know where everything comes from. Uh, will allow it to go through the consumer cycle or the business cycle and then return back and then be brought back to the manufacturing for demanufacturing and then this process is allowed to just keep looping. 
so that way you, you lose a, a percentage, but it'll be very small. Um, we're now watching the introduction uh, of legislation that's beginning to have a global presence. Now, the reality is, is that, you know, in our lifetimes we're seeing, um, God, am I going to get political? Um, this concept of uh, nationalism, imperialism, uh, expansionism that's gone out in the world um, by dominating countries, whether it's European countries or, or other countries, but specifically America through, you know, corporate domination. Um, has now just basically exploded and are watching a lot of seed companies come up around the world um, and mimic and, and mirror businesses. So eventually we have to have, sorry, global standards. Uh, you're not going to have any more of this uh, hegemony of one you know, company or one country over another. You're going to have to have this cooperation go on. Um, in the United States today, just, I'll just say this because it's kind of a sweet comment, um, think tanks are predominantly for competitive advantage. There is not one cooperative think tank in the United States. Fascinating. Yet this is really because of, you know, we're now in the, this extreme pattern of cooperation. Eventually the think tanks for cooperation need to come into play. Uh, we actually uh, look at the, the process of what goes on and how we take obsole obsolescent equipment and actually feed it through. Um, if nothing else, and I know this is uh, quite hard to see, uh, what this basically does is, does is, is it, it just uh, defines how we take things in and how it goes through an entire recycling process. Uh, the end run is there's only one or two pieces that we take in which actually do go into a landfill. So if you want to have fun with the recycler, and they'll say, oh no, nothing goes into a landfill, you can have a little fun. Ask them if they process TVs. If they say they do, if they get chipboard on wood, chipboard has to be reprocessed through landfills. It's glue. It has no other value. So it does go to a landfill. So that's one fun thing to do. With glue. So I always love it. Oh, no, no, we recycle everything. Oh, okay, okay. There's other things as well, but I'll stay with that. A uh, concept of a CRT or a television tube, a cathode ray tube. Is this interesting? Are you guys okay? Very interesting. Okay. Um, if, if it's not, if you, I have to continue anyway. That's just, that's <laughs> We're stuck with you. The, the sweetness of a, of a CRT is that this is a, a dying art. Uh, this is really coming into its really its last decade of use. It's it's predominantly out of use completely now uh, throughout the world. Um, what's fascinating about TVs, which people don't know, uh, the front two thirds is the weight of the glass, um, and that's. Uh, pretty well clean glass in terms of our standards today. The back third is lead, and the reason why is that when you, you know, the, the science or the chemistry of that is that when you're shooting through an electron ray, you don't want the uh, dispersion to occur, so that lead keeps it focused in and it sends it to the, the aluminum phosphor sheet in the front, not phosphorus, phosphor, luminescence. Uh, so that way it can be bounced off. How do I know this? Because I read it and I can repeat this, and it's, I sound brilliant when I you know, read books like everyone else does. Um, but the reality is that it's all common knowledge. Uh, it's made up of uh, a little bit of nickel predominantly. Uh, there is no place in the United States that allows for the smelting of glass. The smelting of the glass is done, well, they have a place called Ohio, but I'm not, I won't go there. Um, the only other place is New Brunswick, uh, which is cost prohibitive by rail. And the other place in the world, two other places, is Malaysia. The last place is India. And what they do is they recycle the glass. There's a couple of ways we can reuse the glass, which is sweet, not permitted in California. Uh, California only allows glass to glass recycling, but there is glass to cement recycling. Uh, there's glass to um, asphalt recycling. Uh, there's glass to brick recycling. So this is, there are potentials to, to use the glass a different way. So if um, that's clean glass on the front, yes. why can't it be smelted in California? What's the reason? Um, there are no smelters, no, are no active they permits for smelters in California anymore. Because yes. of the byproducts? The uh, because of the pollution to the air, pollution to the water, pollution to the land. So they've blocked it off. Um, we're one of only three facilities now in the three years mm -hmm. that we've set up in California that actually fully permitted to actually cut these, break these, open these, nowhere else. But one other place in LA, one other place in Fresno. Um, so we've jumped from being a small little guy within three years to now being one of the top three. And there are about 60 recyclers in California. There's about 250 approved collectors. So these 200 go to the 60 recyclers. 
of the 60 recyclers, only three guys are doing this. Um, we don't even take in other recyclers' materials. They're shipping it to other states. Now, the biggest guy, and I won't mention any names, uh, was very clever, and he would do millions of pounds a month of glass. And he shipped it out to a place called Yuma. Now, it's not the same like you know from the 310 to Yuma or any of the movies we've seen. Um, and they mounded it on the ground. Uh, some TV crew went out there, filmed them about two years ago, I think it was 2009, 2010, and said, where does all this glass come from? Oh, we, you know, we take it as a, as a dump, and they found out this one company was dumping, and they went to the company and said, you know, do you dump out there? They said, no, no, absolutely not. We wouldn't dump glass out there. We'd never do that. Then they found out that they owned part of the company. So immediately they had to divest. So this, you know, transparency is extremely important in our business. Um, because if eventually, if we don't know where all the downlines are, where things are going, we're in deep trouble. Uh, so the one-third glass is what, right now, today, I, I believe we should be concerned with front glass, uh, but I won't go into that in too much detail yet. But um, the, the back glass, because it has lead, it's 35% lead, roughly, to give you a number. Um, th this uh, back here is also another 30% lead, a little tube. This is where the gun of it is. It's how we drive through the electron. It plugs in. Um, so this is the breakup of the, of the components of, of uh, a CRT2. It has a little bit of aluminum, a little bit of copper. Um, how do we make our money? The state of California pays for us to be in business. It's a loss leader to take apart TVs. In every state except California, you'll pay between $10 and $50 to recycle your TV, your old CRT TV. And eventually, this is going to roll over to the LCDs and plasma TVs. But in the state of California, you guys pay, we pay six, eight, ten, twenty-five dollars to be twenty-five dollars to actually have as a environmental fee when you go to Best Buy or any other places that you want to buy your television set. You don't know that, and none of us are smart enough yet to say, "Hey, look, if we give our bottle and we bring our bottle back, we get money back. Why aren't we getting our money back?" So what's wrong with you, California? We just haven't put the pieces together yet. That should come, and I hope it does come. I would encourage that. To uh, but for right now, we're paid by the state of California from all the fees that they collect to actually recycle this. And we get paid now a fixed rate of 39 cents a pound. What's the cost to do this? 37 cents a pound. So that two cents is something that we hold on to. Right. And what's the reality? Yeah, yeah. What's the reality? The state of California does not pay 100% on what you submit. They look for every way not to pay. So it becomes the loss leader. So although we're doing an uh, environmental service, we can go into that some other day and I'll have a full board. So he's not a uh, The other thing that our <laughs> company much, does yeah. is uh, data destruction, um, whether it's hard drives. A lot of companies are in this, and this it's a wonderful industry to do. Um, you certainly can uh, take care of it, but our difference is we not only recycle it and shred it, we also then dispose of it and make sure it's reused. So you know, this is a one-stop shop versus going to different places. If you were curious and you really wanted to spend 15 minutes talking about this, I would explain how the BOE works with the uh, DTSC, works with Cal Recycle, all the government agencies, how they play, and I actually give uh, courses to the state so they can train other people that are recyclers. And we're doing this up to three years because the state has never given any guidance other than the regulations that said, good luck, here's 50 pages. Then when you read the 50 pages, it's got in every line of every regulation according to regulations of the PRC, of the CRC, of the, and you have to go and bring in all the other regulations, or, and you turn out it's 400 pages. So this past December, we sat down with everyone in our region that was a recycler, and we read through the 400 pages of regulations, which no one had done before. So we don't even know the, the industry that we're in, and, and so this is one way that we can confuse people. So it's really important <laughs> you know, to just know where nothing goes. So this is basically content of the consumer, goes to the retailer, uh, you pay that fee, uh, the U.S. account is set up and the government make, makes a lot of money and gets interest on it. This is the only lucrative division in the state of California at this hour. Why? Because half of the covered electronic wastes are LCDs. And no recycler in the state of California over the last 10 years has ever turned in, or maybe one or two, any LCD to the state for any recoupment. Why? because the world market pays more. So all the money you've paid is now in the coffers of the state and will always remain there. It pays for itself.
Yes, well, we can talk to somebody who has a pass solution for that. <laughs> so we get paid the recyclers and the collectors and the handlers. You guys are all handlers or generators, so you guys can drop it off. So that's how, how this works. Um, it's pennies margins. It really is pennies, and it is volume. You are right about that. But it's in really from uh, you know looking at a, a vision of what we're doing. It's an essential you know, to a community. Uh, we, we have to make sure that we set up some sort of a system that allows that this is not through and, and we have all the regulations we follow we make sure that we have the name and the address and phone of every person you cannot drop off a TV and dump it that's the one thing good in the state of California people do it but uh, we try to avoid it even if you give the name and source uh, you know the, the state will not want to pay you and they make us you know take care of it and recycle it anyway so we do get hit with doing a lot of work uh, we're very guarded about where the sources come from so if you bring stuff from Arizona or from another state we'll say please unless you want to pay us 39 cents a pound we don't want to handle this. We want to make sure that this is all being carried. We're, we're very, I guess, you know, isolationist. But that's the way that goes. Um, the nice thing is, is that if you're running a, uh, a business, um, one of the ways that you can generate income is to host uh, e-waste events. Uh, larger companies can do a corporate social responsibility package, uh, get all the employees to come in. Uh, smaller companies can actually turn to the community, do a community service, you know, a social service for the community, and then it gets you known. You get out there. I mean, even if you start doing a startup, call us and we'll help you facilitate a, an e-waste event. It's just a wonderful way to get to know your community. So there's added value here for those that are interested in doing. It. You want to be a law firm and say, hey, we want to be part of the community. All right, do an e-waste uh, law firm. You know, you know, we really care about the community. You're an insurance broker, let's get out there and let's show it. You're running any type of business. Um, you know, I mean, how many times do we see every Christmas you know, or any winter holiday, we'll, we'll see that the fire you know, stations will open up and do Toys for Tots. So there's nothing wrong with using this as a platform uh, for generating money. Now, it generates, you know, $100, $200, $500, but the, the reach and the implication socially is, is, is far more important than the actual income, unfortunately, at this point. Um, we set up, uh, just to give you an idea of some of the things that we do, um, you know, everything is detail oriented. Everything is labeled, everything is boxed. We know where everything goes in the world. Um, the buyers are out there, they're competitive. Um, there is, uh, if the question arises, where does all this go? Everywhere. Everywhere. I mean, we, we're a little bit guarded about sending it to Africa, per se. Um, doesn't mean that they don't have the capacity. I lived 17 years in Africa. I'm telling you they have great capacity to do a marvelous thing. Yes, I did live in Africa. Um, the, the beauty of it is is that they can certainly handle all of their electronic waste and many things beyond that. Uh, but the reality is is that you know we want to go where the world market is that we can generate the most income. And that predominantly is places like Hong Kong, uh, places uh, like India uh, that are important. So they're, they're the markets at this point in time. They also have the manpower to actually turn it into something of value. To what extent do you actually uh, uh, take apart the devices? I mean, you don't pull ICs off of the circuit boards, no. right? Because yeah. the boards are whole, the transformers are on them. You yes. Don't the transformers yeah, we don't need to go any further. We can't. We have the machines to do it. Mm -hmm. um, one of the reasons why we don't do it is that we look at labor costs in the United States uh, versus transportation costs. So those are the two you know, factors that are the most predominant in, in business at this time for the United States. So it pays not to do that at this point. Uh, when we first started, we were shredding. I mean, we, we just loved our machine. It's the largest machine in the world, actually, for shredding, other than doing the, the Volkswagen, if you've ever seen that one, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, or the fridge that pops up ten times. Uh, but it, it can handle fridges. Um, but the, we, we realized, oh my god, the buyers are taking it whole. Why are we killing ourselves to break it down? So we, we stopped. So it, it's really you know dependent on what the industry does. Um, we tell everyone, I'm sorry, bad jokes that I throw on an occasion. Um, I don't it's know how that fits pretty together. Funny. It feels right for me when I put it together. Um, we tell everyone if you're in this industry, if you're working, you know, ask. I mean, I, it, the sharing of knowledge is going to be far greater. I wish I could tell you that uh, we've captured the market uh, worldwide. We're taking in about 18 percent of the electronic waste. That's it. So the other 72 percent... Sitting in a box in my house, I yeah. think. 80 percent is not being effectively uh, recycled 
or for those of us who get lazy and put it into the trash bin, yes. the recycle bin, what times. do the uh, trash companies do with that stuff? Uh, they, eventually, they eventually call us. Uh, get that on the back. Yeah. Uh, they eventually call us. And they say that, in fact, we're now starting to work with a couple of larger companies. Yeah, there, there's also this carbon footprint issue. Um, again, uh, one of the reasons why I was mentioning how a large company goes in and tries to sell you a bill of goods, um, it's actually counterproductive because they hire transportation companies. So we've got one recycler who goes up and down the state of California with 53-foot containers. Um, he brings it all the way inland, then brings it all the way back to ship it out. So he doubles all of our carbon footprints. Um, but he's got a lot of IPO money, so he can just run it up until he hits that point when, if the market permits, he can just, you know, dump it, walk away. And so the responsibility long term isn't there, but it sure looks good in the short term. With uh, what's been going on with the commodity prices uh, of metallic, specifically yes. copper, silver, and yes. gold, it seems like the circuit board side should become quite lucrative. Are you seeing that? Yeah, very much. And, it, and it, it's been fluctuating uh, tremendously over the last few years. Um, it's, again, all oil dependent. Everything, this whole industry, this whole world runs by the oil pricing. Uh, because everything in this world, to, to whether, whatever we want to do globally is transportation. So uh, we're at that point now where you'll see gold going up and stabilizing at a new level, uh, but you'll see copper prices going down, which is, makes no sense whatsoever. So we've lost 25% of its value in the last uh, three months. Uh, but over two years ago, it's at the same value. So again, you know, sliding Some of that trends. was probably what was going on with China and building. They've slowed down and they mm -hmm. were sucking very up much. all the wiring in the world. Very so. much, very much. Yeah. So when's the next, what's the next growth market? Uh, you're going to watch again around the entire Southeast Asia is going to grow up again because China will become us. And they're going to look to outsource to neighboring countries that are smaller, Mongolia, Tibet. They're going to look to you know, look at all the different countries in Vietnam again, and they'll take on new partners. They can certainly turn around North Korea tomorrow if they wanted to economically. They have the human you know resources to do that. So these things will occur, and this is the reason why eventually it levels out, but it, this could be another couple decades of play. What about rare earths? Rare earth? Uh, there's a lot of it. I mean, you know, people don't realize how much it is. Uh, Russia, the biggest rare earth find in the last uh, decade has been Afghanistan. And that's one of the reasons why we're there. People don't talk about that, but it's phenomenal. It's there. Just in uh, two questions. One, in let's call it collection, community-wise, how come we don't have the pink barrel that we can put all of our electronics? Where, where's the Shame on you. You and I worked on that. What do you know? You're no, no. I, I mean, I mean at residential. Right. Just why, why, why doesn't the government push that effort to say, hey, you know what? You really do need to dispose of this properly, inclusive of right. compact fluorescent bulbs, yeah. which that's all circuit board. Right. Why don't they do that? And mercury. They just haven't gotten to that level. There, there are a few companies that make it available, but they, they haven't developed it as a, a strong. Also. You can't put them, crush them in the same type of uh, bin that they're using, you know, the so it's really dumpsters. So it's a different type of dumpster. Processing right. is what it really breaks down. And, and the problem is, uh, because it mixes with hazardous material, so what people will do without thinking is they'll throw in a CRT TV. Once that turns into dust and starts, then it's a land <coughs> issue. And then, so they, they have to be very guarded. If you said only, you know, like don't put your light bulbs in the garbage, everyone puts their light bulbs right. in. Right, okay. So it's compliance. Very, very big factor. Tom was, uh, Tom abandoned. Uh, you touched on CFL, so obviously uh, they're, they're doing away now with incandescence and CFL is a big thing. And it's my understanding that CFL, I guess, has, a, you know, I don't want to talk about mercury, but it's about the, I guess, about what you have in a, in a, in a yes, yes, pan. Yes, So what is your concern? I mean, is, should there be a concern about CFLs and the amount now that that's going to be the light bulb that we go to? Uh, Are you are going to that. Is it, is it a concern? And, 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 and I, you know, for me, and, and I know what the energy LED. agencies where I'm at, but they've got to come um, LEDs are, are the preferred they are, light they are. that they are. we like to, to look to. So why are we pushing CFL so much? And you, can you, can can see board LED. you can thank Senator Jane Harmon for that one and her PAC because it really, the, the, the law that says no more incandescent and it's all about CFL, she's the one who rallied. 
compact glass, more LED, it doesn't matter. We need to be more energy efficient. But the disposal, and what they don't tell you is, in a commercial building like this, there's a hazmat fee that gets paid to collect all of these fluorescent light bulbs. But we don't pay that in the residential community, which actually is one of the biggest users of compact fluorescent bulbs. Right. Forget the mercury part of the argument. It's actually the circuit boards, which have the precious metals, the lead, the cyanide, the plastic, whatever else we've talked about that you know are in there, that are far more hazardous than the mercury. And, and, and by the way, we can't manufacture fluorescents or even LED chips in the United States. This goes back to the CRT argument. Uh, the, the, the PV tube said it, it's essentially you can manufacture those in other countries and we can use them, but we need the hazmat fees to dispose of them, but they're ignoring the residential argument. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I brought that up as a question. Is how do we really dispose of them? There is no real answer, and it's, and it's really a terrible thing that we're putting into the landfills. And if I knew the answer, I'd be more Yeah, that's interesting. I, know, I mean, I know that, um, it's like you were talking about, you, you purchase them at Home Depot, and Home Depot will take them back. Right? Right. Which, like, people understand that, but how many of us are going to take the time out yeah, but they, to they, do that? They, you know? What we don't know is the cradle-to-grave concept. So the, the concept of going all the way to grave is <coughs> these guys go to the, you know, unfortunately, the, the uh, hazardous landfills. There's three in California. Right. They're, they're, not, they're, they're not going into reclamation. Yeah. Um, so the reclamation part is the most important part, not burying them. And then we, we also can't classify them here in California. So that's a whole other issue. Yeah, we, we've also hamstrung ourselves in many ways in trying to be environmentally friendly. Uh, and the reality is it's because lobbyist groups and, and you know, economic concerns skew us in our understanding. So again, it, it's a constant, you know, ebb and flow of how we finally come to some, you know, new stasis or, or new platform where we say, okay, this is the, you know, the, the new green. Yeah. And, it, and, it's, and it's all marketing. Yeah. It's all marketing. By the way, there's light bulbs that last 20 years. And they don't sell them from the open market. And Gerald, take a minute to tell Absolutely. Who you are, oh, it's like, and explain why you know what you're talking about. So our, our company designs and manufactures uh, an <coughs> eco-standard of lighting fixtures, products that reduce the energy 50 plus percent and last 20 plus years. So in that maintenance footprint, when we talk about cradle to grave, the regular light bulbs, even fluorescents, we, we mark those 10 times over. So what that says is there's a way to do this. However, corporate giants don't want to because of planned obsolescence. They cause you to have to buy the equipment over and over and over at a rate that, by the way, we're using 120-year-old technology that Tesla invented. We just improved on its electronics. Our concerns, and Jeff and I have talked about this too in the, in the past, is how do you then in 20 years reclaim these and put them back into a system so that we're, we are, as a manufacturer, being environmentally responsible. But I've got a 20 plus year span to have to worry, not a, remember fluorescents, compact fluorescents don't even last that long in your house. They're terrible products. And they're expensive versus a regular light bulb. So we look at this on a global concept, but what about the US on, the energy, on the energy use side of it, though? Hmm. Are you at home Com most of the day? Comparatively. Comparatively. That's also the life cycle Kate event, huge. but that's what we talk about, cradle to grave life cycle events that say, what's your usage factor and where are you using it? And the commercial sector where you use it is actually the largest energy hog. Right. So when you look at that, you have to say, what goes on with all of these as they blow out and then how do you put those back into a system without poisoning our landfills? And what Jeff does is great by taking these things, you know, putting them into a neat little package of a pallet and putting them back into a system, okay? There is nothing like that for the lighting industry. And, and, and it's, a, it's, it's an incredible argument to, to have, but the solution really is buy a different product. But, but you have to know about that and you have to be educated as a public to know if you have a business, there are other options. If you, if you, you know, have a business, you have an option here to recycle too. I know of a $5 million system that's just amazing. That's a fully contained uh, electric smelter. Um, and it is remarkable. And it will separate everything out into its elemental forms and allow every single elemental form to be sold off. 
It's, it's mm -hmm. stunning. The electricity bill will kill us. So we would need a field of maybe 25 to 30 acres just of solar panels <laughs> just to allow its daily operation to reduce the cost. I mean, right. like, things like that. And just so you know where I'm coming from, uh, we do energy efficiency measures. So we're measuring the LEDs, we're measuring the CFOs. We can actually tell you live and show you what an LED is using every five seconds versus another light bulb in a building when we're measuring it. So if you take the KWH then, but, you know, but, but where, are you, where are you offsetting it then? So if you're burning more KWH <coughs> within a building and you're getting that from a plant that's burning fossil fuel, what's that doing to well, the part, part, part of that argument though is it's design implementation and you know, God bless the state of California for having the best energy efficiency rules that have screwed everything up. Because we see in other, the other 50 states, or the other 49 states, much uh, more opportunity from an economic standpoint to improve because we've written ourselves out of, through legislation on how to improve here in California. So by law, you gotta have 50 foot candles in this conference room. It's a terrible rule because you can operate under a much different precipice. And so when everyone, we actually get concerned when everyone starts talking about how much light they're using, how much energy they're using. We, we talk about life cycle and cost of operations. That's a much more sexy story to any business owner, guy who has a million square foot building, you know, in San Bernardino. Uh, you guys ought to get together. And talk know, about those, those are the kinds of things that we look at and, and we want guys like Jeff to actually be in every state so we can send our stuff and we don't have to go, how do we get back to California? Yeah, the, the nice thing is, is that in a competitive model, I would tell you, we don't want you to compete with us, but in our model, we want you out there. We want you collaboratively out there. Um, and it's, it's critical, uh, at least at, at this point in time. Um, there, there's a couple concepts in business, and I'll finish with this, and I'll let you guys talk about it. The one is called blue ocean, red ocean. Have you heard these concepts before? Our blue ocean is, is that you create something in the business model that's so unique that no one is going to be able to compete with you. Uh, an example is everybody has, and they, they, they use this as a classic thing, um, everyone knows that um, circuses are for children. But if you make Cirque du Soleil and make it for adults, you're in a unique model. And no one will compete with you. Uh, the rest of us are you know, thinking that we're in the uh, environmentally friendly you know, recycling model. So what we do is we offer our services and we say, if you come and you work with us, we're going to pay you five cents a pound for all your electronic waste scrap. And the next guy goes, no, I'm going to pay six cents a pound. And all this feeding frenzy occurs, and we literally chew each other out to the point where, you know, in a red ocean, uh, we've killed each other, and the whole market's just dying, and the guy in the blue ocean is just carrying on. So whenever you're in a business that uh, has no distinguishing features, and electronics isn't really, you know, it's not a unique model. Anyone can do this. Um, you have to make sure that you have some sort of unique value proposition that you can get out there. In our case, it's, it's setting up a higher standard and allowing for, you know, really a, a better quality of knowing what things are being done. But the reality is we can all do this. Um, I wish I could tell you this is a difficult model. It's not. I, anybody from Arkansas can be an electronic waste uh, recycler, and it's lucrative. It'll make you money. Please. I had uh, <coughs> my, my last presentation, my presentation here last month was uh, moving my business to the cloud. So I had lots of PCs and servers and various things, and I found it was very challenging to try to get rid of this stuff. Yeah. Um, I and I started, I started for a couple of years. I actually, I believe I called, I saw your ads on the internet. Okay. I called, nothing happened, so. Don't call this. I'll make sure nothing happens. Well, so I ended up taking it to, <laughs> <laughs> take it to Goodwill. Good, and Goodwill and they brings it to us. It. Now, do they bring it to you? Yeah, or they bring it to us. Yeah. Okay. So it all ends up in the same place either way. Yeah, because we're the recycler. They're all collectors. They all say we do the right thing, and that's great. And the, the nice thing is there you got a, you got a nice write-off. So it's, it's yeah. good we give it. So you use that advantage if you can. Uh, I think nonprofits have that, that service. It's like giving away your car. I think it's an important step. Um, you know, that's the collaborative model. Um, you know, and unfortunately, the state is, is taking us in uh, a combative model. Uh, they want to hold on to their money, and they're not seeing the value of uh, having flexibility. So we're, I think going back to this comment, you know, that Gerald's making about regulations, when regulations are too binding or too literal, which we tend to do as a society, that's why we're, we're, we're so litigious. Um, forgive me. 
Um, I can't argue with anything yeah, you just said. What happens is, is that we start interpreting words instead of the spirit of the law, or, or actually what was the, the whole concept of what we're trying to do. So, you know, I, I love litigators. I appreciate them. I, I prefer arbitrators. You think he's lying? His lips are moving. Right. It's, it's right. I'd like to recycle a lot of litigators um, <laughs> through the shredders. Um, but the, the reality is, is that uh, you work with the system you've got, and this truly is the best system we have in the world, uh, hands down. And this has got a lot of problems, but it's still you know, the best thing going on there. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much.